Pat and Murray today. Linda is our local herbalist, herb educator, and community organizer, and I believe many more things. Hopefully you will tell us more about that. So um, welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Is it possible to turn the lights down or off? Yeah, that's that really nice. nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said my name is Linda Conroy, and I'm an herbalist, and I live here in Spoon, right on the river. So it was nice. I did get to walk to presentations right out here. So it's a beautiful morning. We were able to walk here. Um, and so I'm going to do a presentation for you on growing herbs. And I um, I have to say I'm, I'm a reluctant gardener. <laughs> I, I have started out my herbal um, work as a forager, as a wild forager, and that's been a real passion of mine. So you're going to see that in here. Um, it's hard for me um, to not talk about the wild plants. Um, and a lot of times they're coming up in our gardens anyway, so it's really nice to know how to incorporate them in addition to growing herbs. And so I'm going to talk about growing culinary herbs, growing um, uh, medicinal herbs, and just how I like to go about doing it. Because as you all know, as in you know, your garden club, there's many ways to garden. And I tend to be very focused on things like sustainability and permaculture and approaches to gardening that work with the land, um, utilizing organic mass to um, fertilize my garden. Um, Example, and they are the best fertilizer on the planet. <laughs> um, speak up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will. So, um, so like I said, I raise rabbits, and they're my garden fertilizer. They do a really, really good job. I had this uh, uh, tomato plant in one of my garden boxes last year that was looked like it was on steroids. It was a um, cherry tomato plant, but it was the biggest cherry tomato plant I've ever seen. It was like a little tree. So. Um, so rabbits, if you have rabbits, or if you want rabbits, just come to my house <laughs> because I have more than I can use. They're like, you know, pooping machines. So um, you can go ahead, Eleanor. Thanks, and um, uh, forward the slide. So my name is Linda Conroy. I'm an herbalist and a wild forager. I grow and wild harvest the vast majority of the herbs that I utilize in my kitchen and that I utilize for making medicine. And so the herb I'm picking here, does anybody know what that is on the slide? Anybody recognize it? It's actually, you probably recognize it. Hypericum. Hypericum perforatum, which is St. John's wort. <laughs> and I do wild forage it, but I also uh, like to grow a little bit in my yard as well. And actually, we were just talking about the prairie that grows over by the Vist Golf Course. There's a bunch of hypericum planters there. So if you don't know this plant and you want to go and meet it, you can go and um, meet it. And it's really cool because if you take the buds and the flowers and squeeze them, they have a red oil in them. And so it's almost like magic. You have this yellow flower, but red oil, like it's on your fingers when you touch this plant. So you can go ahead and forward the slide. Um, so why grow herbs? I always like to ask that question. Like, why would you want to grow them? So obviously for culinary purposes, we have a lot of herbs that we can add into our um, food or spices. And a lot of times I'll work with people because I also make um, herbal products and cosmetics and things like that. And um, a lot of people will say, well, I can only eat so much of this stuff. <laughs> so, so then what else do you do with it? So uh, that's part of what I'm going to talk about um, through my talk is not only how do you grow them, but what do you do with them? Because that's always a question. But um, met for the medicine chest, um, that's another reason. And simply mint is a great herb to grow because it's a great herb for um, calming an upset stomach, so medicinally it's really nice, but of course it's a culinary herb. And all of these herbs you're going to hear me talk about, you can put in salads. So adding a little mint to your salad is really nice, adding some parsley to your salad, any of the things that you're growing. And a lot of the flowers that you grow are edible and they're really nice sprinkled on top of your salads. And people think you're pretty nifty when you um, sprinkle flat fruit, beautiful flowers on top of your salads. 
Um, so, and you know, it's easy and satisfying. Herbs are pretty forgiving. How many people are growing herbs already? They're pretty forgiving, right? I mean, most of them, especially things like mint. Um, actually, you know, we were just talking about how a lot of times you want to um, put them in a pot to keep them from running, <laughs> because, and that doesn't always work because they bust out of the pot, you know, the roots. Um, but herbs smell good. Um, that's really a great um, thing is that they really smell good when you're out in the garden. Um, they attract pollinators to the garden. And actually, I added a slide to this after I made a copy. The next slide is going to be about herbs that specifically attract pollinators, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, they're nutrition, uh, nutritious. Herbs have a lot of nutrition in them. One of the things that we can do is we can prepare them in ways that optimize their nutrition, and that's something I'll talk about in my talk as well. Um, and they keep pest problems to a minimum, so you can plant um, certain aromatic herbs, and they can keep pests um, out of your garden, especially like things like marigolds, which aren't necessarily herbs, but those kind of really aromatic, more like I always call them like stinky herbs. <laughs> it's not so great. Flies and other, you know, insects love those. So these are some of the reasons. Of course, there's probably a million more. Can anybody think of any reason you grow herbs in a garden? How about you? There's the obvious reason. <laughs> yeah. okay. Aesthetics too. Aesthetics, yes, they're so beautiful, right? I mean, I was um, visiting my teacher in New Zealand in January. She and it was summer there, and she has this beautiful two rows of lavender. They're just so gorgeous, and they gr it grows really well there in the winter. There, I'm like, here, you know, it's iffy. And, you know, yeah, the aesthetics of that, when you walk into her garden, it's the first thing you see. It's just so beautiful. And, the, and it's aromatic, too. And then there's bees all over it. So, um, and so I don't tend, to, like when I grow lavender and um, rosemary, I tend to bring them in. I lost my rosemary. I'm sad. But you can go ahead. So here's just a. a chart that I um, got off the internet of different um, herbs that attract pollinators. And I think we've all heard that the bees are really struggling and you know having a hard time. And not only the honeybees, but the native bees. And so one of the things we can do is plant a lot of um, these herbs that the bees are attracted to <coughs> and bring them to our garden. Now I think most of us who garden know that um, like my neighbors don't garden and they keep very well managed their lawns. They don't have a lot of insects in their lawns. All the insects are in my lawn, all the bees. <laughs> you know, I've got you know the big bumbles in my garden. <laughs> you know, it's really wonderful. And you see, they come when when you plant stuff. And even last year, so I've been in my house for three years and I'm renting. So you'll see I'm doing more box gardening at this point. But. Um, there was a hummingbird came to my yard last year and was on some of the plants and it was just like, wow, oh, this is just so nice because we're, you know, when we plant these things, we're attracting all of this beautiful wildlife and diversity to our gardens, which is really wonderful. You can go to the next. Okay, so it all starts with soil, right? So nothing can grow without soil. So um, most plants like good drainage, really rich soil. Of course, there's nuances. But herbs are, you know, fairly forgiving. Um, some of the more Mediterranean herbs like lavender and rosemary require a lot of drainage. Um, so you want to make sure that your soil is really aerated and maybe even add some gravel or stuff to your soil if you're growing those herbs. Um, but generally speaking, you want a really nice rich soil. And like I said, I, um, I'm utilizing my rabbit um, manure for my garden. And the nice thing about rabbit manure too is you don't have to age it so it can go right into the garden. Um, and that's just really perfect. And we had worms in the rabbit manure last year that were huge. You couldn't believe how big they were. <laughs> so that was a very satisfying thing. Is we, I, I put in all these big garden boxes and then I was, you know, making sure a lot of those worms got into the boxes. Would deer manure be like rabbit? You know, it's like little, That's little interesting. Probably, but I never oh. put deer manure in my garden. Curious. But I would guess so. I mean, I would guess it's the same. So, because goat manure is the same, you know, it's the same, um, you know, pellets. So, 
I would guess so. But if you're utilizing, of course, chicken manure, or cow manure, horse manure, you need to age it um, for a period of time before you can put it on the ground to, to the higher elevation. Obviously, it's too high. So, um, but soil is really, really important to the <laughs> the most. Um, and then um, when we're if we're starting with seeds, and so there's different. You can start with seeds, of course, or you can start with <coughs> starts. You know, I think we've probably all done a little bit of both. Um, so if you're going to start with seeds, you have you want to know what the germination requirements are for your seeds. A lot of seeds, um, like to overwinter, like if you have plants that self sow. Like, does anybody know what seeds these are in this picture? They're the coolest seeds. How old are those older? The calendulas? Yeah, yeah. It's cool. These are calendulas. They look like little worms, yeah. spiny worms. <laughs> They're the craziest looking seeds. The first time I saw them, I was like, holy cow, what is that? I, I couldn't believe it was a seed. Um, but so seeds have different requirements, and calendula likes to self sow, it's a self sowing annual. And it um, will, it likes to overwinter. So, you know, it likes the cold, what we call cold stratification. So it needs that requirement. Some um, require scarification. And, you know, scarification happens like when birds eat seeds and then it goes through their digestive system and when they plant it. Like wild asparagus, wild parsnip is all planted by the birds. It goes through their digestive system. It has that requirement for scarification. It wraps up the coating, and then they plant them. That's why we have wild parsnip and wild asparagus all over the place, which is just your garden asparagus and your garden parsnip planted by the birds. But we can scarify things if that's what's needed, and so you can take a little bit of sandpaper and wrap up the seed, seed coating and then plant them. Mm -hmm. So that's um, one other way to stratify. Um, and then some um, uh, seeds need to be soaked in water and you know get really moist. Um, like um, nasturtiums are one of those that benefit from being soaked before you plant them. So I'm not going to tell you the uh, stratification requirements for every seed, but if you're going to plant seeds, you want to be aware of that and aware of um, what the needs of each seed is. So. And then, of course, plants start. <laughs> and we start to see plants, you know, available for sale. Um, and we can, you know, purchase a lot of different herbs. And especially our common culinary herbs are available. A lot of times we won't find the medicinal herbs like that I'm looking for. So if I'm going to order starts, um, there's a couple different companies. Strictly Medicinals is a company you can order. Um, unusual medicinal herb starts and seeds from them. They have things that you might not find other places. They have a catalog that's you know really dense and has a lot of information in it. And the nice thing about their catalog too is they tell you all the information like the stratification requirements for the seeds if you order those. Um, but you can also order plants from them. So if you would rather you know use uh, your starts and not grow it from seed yourself, you can order starts from them. But of course at our low even at the co-op here in Stoughton, you know, we have your sage and you know your general culinary herbs, thyme and things like that. And those herbs are not only culinary, which is kind of interesting. I think we used to know this more than we do today. But like sage is a wonderful herb for a sore throat to make a gargle from it. So if you how many people are growing sage garden sage? So there's something you can do with it, is make a nice gargle um, if you have a sore throat. And thyme is antispasmodic. It makes a really nice cough syrup, cough tea, um, and so that's something. Um, how many people are growing thyme? You, you have the herb garden. <laughs> so, um, so these culinary herbs oftentimes also have medicinal applications um, for them as well. So um, you can grow, how, how can you grow them? Like where can you grow them? You can grow these, herbs are great for fl in flower beds, in borders, rock gardens, containers. Um, you'll see in a little bit, I'll show you um, this uh, neat concept of a spiral herb garden that came out of the permaculture movement. 
and usually you're utilizing rocks to create the spiral. And it's really beautiful. It puts like um, creeping thyme around the rocks and it'll you know flow down. We talked about aesthetics that makes it look really, really beautiful. Um, and for culinary herbs, it's nice to choose a spot that's close to your kitchen if you're actually going to utilize them. Because if it's like halfway down your yard, you're probably not going to go get them when you need them. But if you can just pop outside, you can grab them. I used to live in um, Seattle, Washington, and I had a big rosemary hedge right outside of my kitchen. And so everything I ate had rosemary, <laughs> everything. Um, but you know, I, I just, I love my plant last year, but I just have one little plant now, so I'm more careful with it. But, um, so um, some herbs are annuals and others are perennials, so that's um, something to keep in mind. Um, and you really only need a few plants um, of most herbs to be able to dry some. Like I said, a lot of people will say to me, I have all these herbs, I don't know what to do with them. And drying them so that like with pine and sage in the winter, you will have them available to you, both for culinary purposes, but also, you know, for medicinal purposes as well. Let me go to the next slide. So here's um, two of my favorite approaches to growing herbs, and one is the spiral herb garden, which is very beautiful, um, and I'll show you a real life version of that in a minute. And usually in one of my um, intensive herb programs, um, for the past three years actually, we've built in different locations these spiral herb gardens. And they're really fun to build. It's community building. It gives, it creates camaraderie. And then you have um, these wonderful herbs. And the idea of the spiral, which is really neat, is you plant things at the top that need good drainage and things that need more sun. And then you choose the spots for the other herbs based on their requirements. If something likes a little bit of shade, you can put it in the back, et cetera. Or if something likes it more moist, you can put it around the base of the garden. Um, so it's really a neat concept and it's really beautiful. And you can make them bigger or smaller. The ones we built have some of them have been smaller, some of them have been bigger. And then of course boxes. Herbs are great in boxes. And I, so last year I met this woman who um, I've been buying um, the railroad boxes, like for storage, and they have lids on them. They're really cool. And so I'm using those as raised beds. And they're heat treated, so they're not chemical treated. So they're really a nice option. So I've been putting um, those. I have, do I have like 20 of those, I think, <laughs> in my yard right now? They aren't all full of soil. We've slowly been adding soil and, and planting herbs in them. Um, and, some vegetables as well. And so I really like growing in raised beds. They're, it's easy for harvest. There's, you know, I eat my weeds, but you know, but it's not as, uh, as difficult to weed them. Like there's just a lot of benefits. Even when I have a more, I rent where I am, so I'm not establishing a permanent garden. I'm using the boxes, but I'm gonna take the boxes with me and I'm gonna keep growing in them because I love them. <laughs> They're really wonderful. So, and of course, you, this is different than what I'm doing, but you can put a box, you know, boxes right near the house. And like this theoretically could be right by the kitchen door, which is a nice um, option that we talked about before. And of course you can grow herbs in rows, that's fine too. And especially if you're gonna grow a whole lot of them. I teach on a farm in West Bend, Wisconsin, and one of the young women there who's been through my intensive eight month program, she's growing herbs for the farm now. And so she's got rows of holy basil and rows of rosemary and lavender. And you know, she's doing it on a, a bigger scale. And so she, you know, she's doing it more like a like a vegetable garden kind of a thing. So you can go to the next slide. So here's one of my groups that built this spiral garden. This is the biggest one we've built, <laughs> uh, and you can and we've planted. And then this was the one we built last year, actually, um, at Wellspring Farm. This is at a place called the Resiliency Institute. It's a permaculture um, organization, and I taught an eight month program there. And one of the things we did for them on their site was we built this. And then this one over here we built at Wellspring Farm last year. Um, and this was after it had been gr you know, growing for almost a year. And so you can see there's basil in there and you know, 
uh, or oregano and you know a lot of the usual suspects. <laughs> we almost always end up, and I don't know if we did this time, I can't really see, but we almost always end up putting rosemary at the top because that's good to me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. often the herb we put up there. Are there any, besides rosemary, what other herbs like good drainage? Uh, lavender, that's great. Most of the medicine is natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they seem to do better than the ones we have in the And it's just getting more heat, wet, and cold. And it's worse. And one of the things, too, is you can create a microclimate, right? So one, the rock here, if it gets the sun, will create a little bit of warmth as well. And then if you're growing those herbs and you want to keep them outside and you put them up against like a warm retaining wall with really good drainage and you mulch them heavier, really heavily, you'll have a better chance of your rosemary and lavender overwintering here in the fall. Just really, really making sure it's not going to get it. Because cold isn't its worst thing. It's wet and cold. So if it's cold and you have good drainage and you mulch it really well, then and you have that you know microclimate of a retaining wall, you're more likely to have some like good drainage. Yeah. But aren't these really cool? Yeah. And they're, they're really and they're so fun to build. You two ladies helped to build. Did you, did, did you enjoy it? Much. Yeah, I've never done it before. It was a fun experience. Yeah, super fun. And they're all different. Everyone's different. <laughs> These are two, and then we built a third one at an organization called Safe Bridging, um, which is a, um, a spiritual center. On, it's actually on the other side of the state. But um, if anybody wants a spiral garden, my students can come in and sell <laughs> one for you. Um, so you can go ahead. Okay, so the boxes, and unfortunately I couldn't get a picture of my whole box. I was looking through my pictures from last year, and not that I couldn't, I didn't, I don't know why. This is the edge of the box. <laughs> and so, um, you know, they, they're, they're pretty good size, and they're all over. Um, and, you know, I pack the herbs in pretty well. This is Anna's Hyssop here, and, um, you know, I have a pretty, a fairly good amount. And it was funny because the other day I had the anesthesia up in a big bowl and I still hadn't stripped it off. It was dry <laughs> from last year. Um, so the other day I finally stripped it off. But um, has anybody ever grown anesthesia? It's really nice, isn't it? It's nice as a um, freshener mm -hmm. and it's also nice dried and it's a little bit of an anise, you know, for sheen type of flavor mm -hmm. to it. Native? Um, it's not native. Not but it's it's really beautiful and adaptable. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't seen it escape and you know take over and do that it kind of seems to see it. It, it is a mint, but it doesn't seem to do what a lot of the other mints do. <laughs> it seems to stay a little more contained. Yeah. All right, we can go to the next slide. So what are some of the commonly grown herbs? Um, we have anise. Borage, this is a borage flower. Isn't that beautiful? Does anybody grow this one? <laughs> this is one of those beautiful flowers you can sprinkle on your salads that are, you know, look just gorgeous and really impressive. Yeah, they're wonderful. And they do spread, right? <laughs> they seed. They yeah, seed they self so. So once you have them established, they're like, oh, yeah. And one interesting thing from an herbal perspective, whenever you see something like a lot that has a lot of hairs like that, it's going to be really high in the mineral sil silica. So that's really nice because it strengthens the hair and the nails. And so I like this herb. Um, you can put it in vinegar and steep it in vinegar to extract those minerals. So and it tastes a little like cucumber, a little bit sort of. <laughs> I wouldn't say exactly, but. Um, so you can make a nice um, infused vinegar and then use the vinegar on your salad dressings or your greens. And you can do that with the vast majority of these herbs, is put them in vinegar and make a nice herbal layer out of them. And then, you know, we have a lot of the usual suspects, of course, basil is really wonderful, uh, chervil, chives, cilantro, dill, I mean, just so many options. Fennel is another one of my favorites. I like the anise. Uh, licorice flavor, and there's some people don't, but I really enjoy it. Um, and um, the fennel, of course, you can utilize the flowers and the leaves and the seeds. So 
They're um, really wonderful. And that's both a medicinal and a culinary herb. Because fennel can really um, also calm and upset stomach, um, especially with um, like gas and mint. Mint is more for like you have an upset stomach and you feel nauseous, and fennel is more like if you have gas. <laughs> so if you're wondering like hey, what's the nuances of these herbs for digestion, that would be it. Um, and that's why if you ever go to an Indian restaurant, a lot of times they'll have fennel at the counter. And now they've started the can because some other cities didn't do that, but um, it, to help you know you digest your food. Of course, parsley, rosemary, sage, tarragon, thyme. These are all just really easy to grow and wonderful um, to put in your garden. Slide. Um, and these are hardy. These plants are, are you know for the most part really really hardy. Parsley and chives. Especially, anybody notice those two once they're established? <laughs> and you know, chives can get a little overwhelming. <laughs> so, again, they make a beautiful spicy vinegar. So, just chop them up, put them in some, I put them in apple cider vinegar, and you'll have this nice spicy vinegar. And actually, if you add the flowers, the vinegar will turn a beautiful pinkish color. So, it's really um, kind of fun to do that. And um, and parsley. A lot of people aren't sure what to do with parsley. <laughs> it's a great herb to add to um, pestos. Like if you're making a basil pesto, add a bunch of parsley to it. Parsley is good for digestion. It's got minerals in it. It's got nutrients. Um, I add it to salads. I chop it up into my salads. So you know, utilize the parsley. It's not just this little sprig on your plate in a restaurant. <laughs> you can actually put it in your food. I think it might be good in soup. I made a, yeah. a mm -hmm. white chicken chili yeah. bean soup, I and I added greens to that. And so I think um, yes, you know, parsley soup. would be nice in soup. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, use your imagination. Like, be creative. My experience with herb cooking with herbs. And I really have a lot of fun with this. It's an art form. So, you know, use your imagination and think, wow, maybe this would taste good. <laughs> and if you're not sure, then take a little bowl of your soup, put it to the side, put a little parsley in it, and see if you like it and before you add it to the whole thing. So, um, so um, one of the herbs, too, and we'll talk about this, I think I have a picture of it on its own, is an herb called lovage. It tastes like celery, that's an herb that's related to celery. It tastes like celery. It's easy to grow. It's one of my favorite, favorite herbs for soup. Um, I dry it and then I, you know, uh, put it through a screen and break it up really small and throw it into soups and stews. Um, so, and actually, I did not grow enough lovage last year. I'm going to grow, I would like to grow probably 10 lovage plants to meet my needs because I really, really want these herbs. Yes. I have a family favorite recipe that the family likes all year round uh -huh. that takes lots of parsley. Oh, nice. Maybe we should share that with your club so um, people have it. Don't share it right now, but maybe we can share it. Um, so that's one of the things I'll get to bring in, in fall because you're not going to, it's not the same as the parsley that you well, there's you two need different fresh kinds parsley. of parsley. Yeah, there's a couple different kinds of parsley. And that recipe calls for us, you know, a specific. And so in October, I have to remember to make sure that I have that parsley and that I bring it in so I have it in February. And this is a good point. So I was saying I'm bringing my rosemary and my lavender in, but you can bring a lot of other herbs in too. And herbs can be grown in pots in the winter. Indoors. I don't have right now in my house, I don't have a sunny enough window to do that. You want a nice window, but if you have that space, bring your herbs in for the winter and it's really nice to be able to snip, off, snip them off and put them in. And fresh herbs definitely taste different than dried herbs. Oh, okay. A lot of times you can put lots more fresh herb into your whatever you're making. And dried herbs tend to be kind of concentrated, they tend to be a little more bitter. Uh, if you've ever noticed that, so um, so it's nice to have the fresh herbs available. So here's lavage. Has anybody else grown this? Highly recommend it. Do you enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, this is nice in salads. Um, you can um, put it in vinegar. You can dry it. Throw it into soups and stews. 
Uh, it's really beautiful too. It gets pretty tall. So where you're placing it, if you're being careful about that kind of thing, um, you know, it's one of those herbs you want to put the kind of more to the back of the garden and not where you want lower things. So um, it's it's a really beautiful um, plant, and I usually can get a couple harvests out of it. So. Um, I, I don't just harvest once, I might harvest, um, you know, a couple times throughout the season, so. And uncommon herbs. So, um, you know, lovage is kind of an uncommon herb. It's becoming a little bit more common, but it's not your common herb you see in a lot of herb gardens. So it's really fun to put some things in that are uncommon. Um, and especially like in my interest with the medicinal herbs, putting the herbs in as well and having those available. And last year, I um, and I had done this years ago, but I hadn't done it in a long time. I planted a really nice bed of sweet grass, which is really beautiful, and it grows well here, which is surprising. I think a lot of people, well, a lot of people are surprised <laughs> that you can grow it here. And um, it smells really good. You can make tea with it. You can dry it. I actually make <laughs> sweet grass baskets, so. That's a really interesting herb to grow, and it's a grass, so it grows like a grass. I mean, it will, you can pack it in a small space and grow a lot of it. And so I created a little raised bed, and I put just sweet grass in that bed. Because it, it will um, compete with other um, grasses, so, or, or the other grasses will compete with it, it's vice versa. So I just put it in this nice bed, and raise and you know raise beds so it's easy to access and harvest if you want to. Um, and it, uh, growing unusual herbs can bring different flavors to the table. Um, there's actually a good book over there, growing um, herbs in the Midwest. I was looking for what people had started, so you might want to take a look at the books that um, they brought out because I there's some some good ones. Um, and again, the medicine cabinet. So for cuts and scrapes and colds and flus, um, you can bring herbs in for that as well. And some of your weeds that you might be pulling out, I'm harvesting <laughs> to make um, some of my medicines. So calendula, this is a, one of my favorites to grow. We saw the seeds earlier. Um, is anybody else growing this? Mm -hmm. It's so easy and it's a self-sowing annual. So once it's established, you'll usually have it just come back year after year. And I always like to tell the story because it was really funny. I used to have calendula right outside my door and I had a grass mat right in front of the doorway. And the seeds got into the mat and were sprouting in the grass mat. <laughs> That's how forgiving it is. Um, and this are, the flowers are edible, so you can put these in your salads. Um, you can also make um, body care products, make infused oils with it, make lotions, massage. It's really healing to the skin. Um, I like it for really dry skin and eczema, psoriasis. It's also a fungal fighting herb. So this herb has a lot of applications um, in addition to being a, an edible flower. So, and it's beautiful. You've got yellows and oranges. Um, this is a more yellow variety. There's some that's a really, really bright orange. And there's also, if you, Strictly Medicinals, the company I mentioned earlier, they grow the original Officinalis um, plant, and it's a tiny little yellow calendula flower that has this vibrancy to it that's amazing. So this, the, most of the varieties we're growing are hybridized from that variety. So I wanted the original plant and I got that. It was really beautiful. So it's nice. I always think it's nice to have different um, varieties and different um, Is it short, shorter than the kind you usually It's a little shorter, yeah. yeah. So it would look nice. To the, and I, this is a couple of years ago, I was growing it in a different garden. So I had the, um, you know, the color variety and I had that one growing in front of it. It just looks really beautiful. So. Okay. Elderflowers. So um, I think um, a lot of us know about elderberries, of course, and they can be utilized for treating colds and flus. But I have a particular affinity for the flowers. And the flowers are um, really good for the skin. They also can be dried and made into a tea. And if you have enough space to grow an elderberry um, uh, shrub, 
it's actually considered a protected site. So, you know, there are traditions where, like in uh, Hispanic um, culture, they like the plant rue. I don't think anybody's growing that, but that's the culinary and medicinal plant. They like to have that in their garden or by their front door because it's a protective plant. And a lot of um, European traditions like to have elder outside of their door at the time. So when I have a more permanent home, that's one of the first things I'll do is to, is to plant an elder shrub at, in, you know, somewhere in my entrance to the home. Um, and then, of course, um, attracting wildlife. The last place I lived, I did have one of these right outside my kitchen window. And I couldn't believe, even in the winter when there's no um, flowers or any foliage on the plant, the birds are in this in the shrub. They love that. So it was always really nice. I'd be doing dishes in the winter and they'd be <laughs> in there. And I'm sure there's just lots of bugs there that they're able to access. So, um, but this shrub medicinally is really nice for the skin. Um, whether you make a wash with it, put it in your bath, um, or um, you can also make an elderflower jelly. You can make elderflower cordials. I mean, once you start working with this stuff, there's a million things you can do with these herbs. Can I get some of these seeds? Okay. They are little tiny seeds. I need to grab some water. So violets. Anybody grow violets? <laughs> or do they just show up? <laughs> So these are wonderful. You can make a tea. The violets are super high in vitamin C, which is really interesting. Vitamin C is an antioxidant that the plant chooses to protect themselves, and uh, violets are particularly high. And the whole thing is edible. So you can eat the flowers. You can eat the leaves and salads. It's also very soothing. It's what we would call a demulcent for the skin or an emollient for um, the um, like the throat for any kind of soft tissue. You can make a syrup, um, and it's really soothing for a sore throat, so both topically and internally. It's just a really, really soothing herb. You can make a jelly. Um, if you take hot, if you take a bunch of uh, violet flowers and either put them in vinegar or pour hot water on them, it'll turn purple, especially, well, of course, if you make purple ones. It makes it, it just makes this beautiful purple color. And then you could turn that into a syrup or into um, a jelly. So violets are my, my favorites. And bee balm. So talk about attracting the bees and the hummingbirds. This is one of the plants that the hummingbirds love. And this one, which is the Menarga fistulosa, which is our wild bee balm, is has thymol in it, like thyme, mm -hmm. so it's antispasmodic. So again, it's a good cough remedy. You can make an infused honey or make a tea from it, but it's also a great culinary herb, so you can throw it in with spice, so you can throw it into things. The, when the plants are young, the leaves are nice, and then as they get bigger, you want to utilize the flowers. And then this one, which is Menarda didyma, is a, a, a more of a culinary, um, it's not quite as spicy, it doesn't have the thyme all in it, but it is edible, so it's nice for um, putting in salads and that kind of thing. And then, like I said, these are just so wonderful for bees, and hummingbirds love these as well, so um, lots of these. And of course, the, <laughs> this one especially really spreads. Mm -hmm. I have this one, you know, is any, has anybody had this one spread much? It seems to contain itself, whereas this one just really goes wild. <laughs> um, so, but I like having them both for the diversity of color, because they just, the colors are really, really beautiful. And then there's a whole bunch of other varieties um, of bee balm that have other um, colors, that, like if you're trying to get some diversity of color in your garden. Hops. Now, this is something I love to grow in my garden. Um, I have made beer with them, but it's not the main thing. <laughs> um, I actually um, utilize these for medicine. It's a good um, relaxer, uh, nervine. It's calming. Um, and it's beautiful. So it's a um, vining herb. And so another th reason I like growing hops is it creates shade. And it utilizes to grow up around trellises and things, and it'll create shade in different areas of the garden. And once hops are established, 
they are very vigorous. I really, when I've had gardens where they've been well established, I've had to dig them out every spring because there'll be all these mushrooms and shoots that'll come up. But cool thing about the shoots is they're edible. So I actually eat them, saute them, pickle them, so I don't have to get rid of them. Or I give the plants to other people. <laughs> and it has taken, whenever I've planted hops, it's always taken three years for them to get established and to like where they are. So last year was my first year with this plant. And it's, you know, it's all right, but it wasn't like I'm expecting this year it'll be a little more like do the deer get into them? No, I think so. No, they're pretty, they kind of have an off-putting flavor, so or smell. So um, I haven't seen. Has anybody else had deer get into your house? I, it hasn't been my experience. So, so, but yeah, I love hops, and I love the smell of them too. And um, also, I do a class, an herbal gift making class, and we always make um, green pillows in that mm -hmm. class. And hops actually promote lucid dreaming. So that's another way you can utilize your hops is to make dream pillows if you want to remember your dreams and have an active dream life. If you want to rest and you don't want an active dream life, don't put this by your bed. <laughs> but if you want that, which is kind of fun sometimes, you know, to invite more lucid dreaming. Especially you know, drink your hops if you're drinking beer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, absolutely. But some Wisconsin farmers I read are growing hops as a yeah. crop because of the many new um, the new microbreweries, the yeah. breweries that yeah. require hops in it. That was not a normal crop growing right. here. Well, it was Maybe actually there was a history of it, and then people stopped growing it. And now they're growing it again. Yes, it's becoming one of the crops people are looking to as um, for mm -hmm. agriculture. So. Um, Ella Campaign. This is a beautiful plant. It's a European plant, but it will establish itself here. It can naturalize really well in the garden. It is a good po uh, pollinator attractor. Um, it is. Um, it gets real tall. It's sunflower-like. So again, the back of the garden. Um, it will, you know, spread itself around. So be aware of that. But this is one of my favorite medicinal plants for coughs and colds. I harvest the root um, for this. And I dig up the root. I harvest off the um, main tap roots coming off of the, the main bulk of the root. I harvest those runners. And then I plant that bulk root back in the ground. And it doesn't miss a beat. So every fall I do this, <laughs> it, it grows right back and it has more roots next year. So it's a very hardy plant. It's really beautiful. It has these beautiful clasping leaves. I always think that's really interesting. You know, the plants that have clasping leaves will often do that to collect water so it keeps themselves hydrated. So it's just the leaves are beautiful, the growing pattern, the sunflower aspect of it. It's just a really nice, I, I think you could call it a stately plant. <laughs> so you can go ahead. Um, roses, I like to grow roses. Um, I would like to have more roses when I have a more permanent garden. Um, but roses are edible, they can be utilized for the skin. There's so many colors of roses. I like to grow hardy roses, and, um, like rugosas and things that are really hardy and don't require any kind of um, you know, like chemicals to grow them. Um, and plus I'm eating them, I'm utilizing them for medicine and food. I eat the hips. Um, so um, I just love growing these. Go ahead. Um, nettle. This might be one some of you might pull out, but this is a really important yeah. herb in our herbal world. It is um, really healing to the kidneys, it's healing to the lungs. It's the most nutritious plant on the planet. If you look at some of the nutritional profile charts on nettle, it kind of blows your mind compared to uh, cultivated greens. This plant is just you know, higher in nutrients than spinach or kale. Um, so if you're pulling your nettle out, don't pull it out, learn to harvest it. <laughs> um, some people do plant it, believe it or not. <laughs> I usually wild forage it, um, but I do always like to have a little bit of it in my garden. Um, my last garden, I did have it um, plant itself somehow. I don't even know how it got there. And then it grew around my compost pile like crazy. Love the compost pile. So um, nettle is very hardy and 
You can dry it for infusions and decoctions. You can powder it and add it to food for the nutrient profile of it. So you don't you really break out some of it. What's that? What if you really break out some of it? Well, you know, I you have that, to learn. I know it in a second. Yeah, you have to learn to touch it properly because mm -hmm. if you brush up against the hairs and break them open and it puts that acid on your skin, causes the irritation. So you want to just be really careful how you handle it. And then what I've found is the more you ingest it, the less you react to it because it has antihistamine-like qualities. So it helps the body deal with its own uh, reaction that it causes. So one thing is to drink the infusion and it's a great herb for dealing without any kind of allergens. So it is its own antidote, so to speak, if you will. When do you harvest it? Um, in the spring before it flowers. Okay. Yeah. So do you do all the leaves? Do you take all the leaves? Um, usually I go and um, harvest the top because if you have it in your garden and you want to harvest it, you can get two and three harvests out of a patch of metal if you prune it. So I always like when I'm harvesting this stuff is prune. So if I prune it, the nettle, the tops, and harvest them, then I'll get, you know, more growth and I'll be able to harvest it more than once. So. You also have to be careful with the leaves, are you saying? Or is it just the, whole the thing has the hairs. And the thing is, though, that we do have a, a species of nettle here that doesn't have much of the um, irritants, the acid that causes the irritation. And so there's, it's a, it has a skinnier leaf, and that one isn't quite as irritating. As a matter of fact, I've gone up and just touched that one and not felt anything. And I can harvest this and not get really get much of an irritant. So I might feel, it feels like a little love tax to me. It's like, hey, I'm here. So paying attention to this plant helps us to pay attention. We'll look at the growing patterns and be aware of it. But really, really nutritious. If you were this nutritious, you would protect yourself as well. That's something to keep in mind. So. Um, plantain, this is one a lot of people pull out, but it's really such an important herb. You can eat the herb for uh, um, in salads. Um, but my most important thing is that this is a great poultice for any kind of itching, irritation. I've been utilizing this for, um, <laughs> if, I guess, if I had tick, and I pull the tick out, and then I chew this up because it has a growing action, I'll put it on the bite, and there's a good chance it's going to pull out the bacteria that would cause Lyme. So it's a good idea to have, know this plant. It grows everywhere. Anybody not familiar with this plant? <laughs> Most of us see it, it grows, it just grows everywhere. Um, and it does, it just has this nice growing action, it stops bleeding. We call it the first aid plant. It's really, really helpful for all kinds of first aid um, concerns, bee, you know, bee stings, mosquito bites. mosquito bites. It stops itching like nothing else. I had mosquito bites last year all over my leg. And you know when you, sometimes you have a lot of them, you can't stop itching, it's like this, then you just can't stop. Well, I took some plantain that I had put in, in alcohol, so I make what are called tinctures, and I put a little water in a spray bottle, and I sprayed that on my leg. It was the only thing that would stop the itching. It was, I, I was like, I have to have this, or I had it by my bed. I was just spraying it on my legs. It helped immensely. Why do you add the water? Um, just so it's not doesn't sting, like so much alcohol. Oh. So I'm just trying to dilute the alcohol a little bit. You don't have to, but it, 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 otherwise it would be a sting. Especially, you know, when you're scratching and it might like mm -hmm. bleed a little bit. So. How, how does this plant remove injury? It has a drawing action. Mm -hmm. This plant draws. Like um, salt has a drawing action, this plant has a drawing action. So what you do if you get a splinter, um, you could you could use a salve, but you could also just chew the plant up and put it right on, and it will draw the splinter off. Can you put it on the hook and chew it on? Yes, and you just chew it up and put it on, it'll stay on there. Yep. Or you can put a band-aid over it, yeah, it's fine. Um, you could also make an infusion or a tea, like say you had a splinter in your hand because it put into your hand really good. Um, you could soak your hand in an infusion of it, you know, a strong mm -hmm. tea and leave your hand in there. I've done that with salt too, like and when somebody's had a splinter or a piece of glass, 
like, and you can do it with plantain too. It's just soak the body part in, if it's a hand or a foot, of course, some body parts you won't be able to soak, but just soak in the water and then it'll draw it out. So, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And it goes like right in the lawn. Oh, it goes in the lawn. Yeah, everywhere. It's it's now, right. take a picture in your mind's eye, and, and when spring comes, look for it. You'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt about it. So. so, harvesting. So, we want to harvest herbs. And I just wanted, those were just a few herbs that I like to grow just to give you some uh, examples. Um, so you want to harvest the herbs when they're at the height of their potency, right? So a lot of times people wait to harvest until they don't look pretty <coughs> anymore because they're not potent anymore. So if you're harvesting for culinary purposes or medicine, you want to do it when they're at the height of their potency. So when your lavender smells really good and the bees are going to it, that's when you want to harvest it if you want to maintain the aromatic. Of course, we want to leave some for the bees, so <laughs> we can you know, plant enough that we leave some for the bees, but then we harvest for ourselves when the bees are, especially when things are flowering, is harvest it when it's at the height of its potency. Um, harvest in the morning, um, but after the dew. So late in the morning um, is a good time to harvest the herbs, if it's a dry day. I mean, don't harvest your herbs if you're gonna dry them or especially if you're going to put them in oil or dry them, don't harvest them on a really wet day. That's just, you know, it's not a good idea. Some herbs you really should wait a couple days, you know, let the sun beat on them for a couple days. And actually, they'll be more aromatic if the sun lets them beat on them for a couple days. Um, and choose herbs that aren't this color and aren't damaged or bruised. Um, oftentimes, I am surprised at the fact that people harvest herbs and dry them. I've even, I used to work in an herb shop and sometimes I'd open the jars and I'd be like, I can't believe we're selling this. <laughs> like, they would be brown and bruised. You want them to look vibrant and look really nice and smell good. Like when I was processing the anise hyssop the other day that had been sitting since the fall um, and I was stripping the leaves off, it smelled really good. I was like, oh, I can't wait to have a tea of this. It's going to be really nice. Um, so, um, so, um, for herbs grown for their foliage, um, harvest them before they bloom. A lot of times, like with lovage, I always harvest that before it goes into flower. If I want to save the seed, I'll let it go to seed, but generally speaking, I'm harvesting that before it goes to flower. Because think about like any plant, wherever the energy is, is going to be the most potent part of the plant. So when the plant starts putting its energy into its flower, you want to harvest the flowers if you want the flowers, but if you want the foliage, you want to harvest that before it flowers so the energy is still in the leaf and that it's the most vibrant in the leaf. Um, with rosemary and thyme, just you know, clip the, um, the leaves. Um, those you can harvest when the plants are in bloom, actually. You actually want to, um, but like with basil, sage, fennel, you want to harvest the leaves before they bloom. Um, and then if you're harvest, if you're growing for seed, um, the seed pods, you're going to watch the seed pods and you want them to actually be mature before you harvest them. Don't harvest them when they're green, like with fennel, for example. You want it to be a little brown and you want it to look like an actual seed um, that can finish <laughs> and that's, vi that's viable um, before you harvest it. And of course, you know, if you're harvesting seed for food or medicine, but also you can harvest your own seed to plant for next year, which is really um, wonderful. And I think I saw that so you do a seed swap library thing here. We don't have this library, but exactly. some of the some of the main county libraries have had um, seeds you can check out with seed libraries. Yeah. Oregon. Oregon. Yeah. Oregon. Yeah. yeah. So this is just a really neat idea um, that libraries are starting to incorporate in having these seed swaps because a lot of times, too, like if you harvest seeds, you have way more seed than you need, and somebody might have a seed that you want, right? So that's kind of fun. So fresh herbs, um, hand, handle them carefully so you're not going to bruise them. Um, refrigerate unwashed herbs in an open or a perforated plastic bag. Don't put them in a closed plastic bag that's going to build up a lot of moisture because they're going to rot. Um, you know, put them in the vegetable vegetable bin, use them up within a few days, unless you're going to dry them. 
Um, to extend herbs, a lot of times you can put them in a, a, a jar of water or a cup of water, and, uh, just like you would a flower arrangement. So just put your herbs in there and it'll keep them fresh for longer. Sometimes, you know, I just put like chives, for example, in a, um, in a jar on the counter in water, and then I'll just keep taking from that. So the chives, for example, will last for a good week or more in water like that. So you'll have fresh chives right on your counter. Um, so those are just some ways that you can, you know, bring the herbs in and have them fresh available to use over time. And then you can freeze herbs, so um, you can just um, put them in baggies. Um, and one thing um, I've done is like cilantro, for example. I've just frozen it in a big chunk and then grate it frozen if I want to use it and put it back in the freezer. So you can do that with a lot of the herbs is just um, put them in the freezer um, whole and then just you know cool them out and grate them to put them in the freezer. And, and that, again, we talked about this earlier, that the fresh herbs have a little bit more flavor or different flavor than the dried herbs. So you might want fresh herb instead of dried herb, and you might want to store it this way instead of um, having it dried. So go ahead. And then if you're drying herbs, air drying them is my preference, and having good airflow. I don't like to utilize um, a dehydrator and if you do utilize a dehydrator, you want to be really careful not to have it on a high heat temperature because you're not trying to cook the herbs. A lot of times I'll see that people will dry them in a dehydrator, have the temperature really high, and again, they'll be really brown, they won't look very vibrant. So my preference is to hang them, and if you can hang them in a room that has a ceiling fan or some way of creating some circulation through them, that's your ideal scenario. Um, that's been a little bit of a struggle where I live right now. I don't really I don't have the best place for drying herbs. But having um, like two fans in a room can really help too if you turn on some fans. Just keep the airflow because if you don't have airflow, they're going to rot and, and mold or break down. Um, so you can see these are different ways you can hang them. Um, down here on the left, I have oak <coughs> straw hanging on a dry, you know, one of those big wooden drying racks is a way that I often am drying my herbs. And on the right is metal um, laid out in a basket. So, um, so there's you know just ways you can do it. Let things dry for a couple weeks. When you're drying herbs, make sure they snap because if they don't snap, they're probably not dry enough. If they're flexible, they have moisture in them. And if you put those in a jar or a plastic bag, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to mold. <laughs> so be really mindful about that. So I don't consider anything dry until the thickest part of the plant snaps. And then I'll go, okay, it's dry. So just make sure it's really, really dry. Okay. Um, a way to collect seeds is to put them in a bag and turn them upside down. This is the lazy person's <laughs> approach to collecting seeds. I love it. Um, and so it's really easy. Just make sure the seeds are viable or vibrant, that they're, they're done. They're not um, green or under, um, under <coughs> and turn them upside down and just let them fall into the bag and then you can collect your seeds that way. It's really, really simple. Um, storage, so you wanna make sure that they're thoroughly dry. I don't store in plastic or glass. I store in paper bags because that, that way the paper bags will, um, if there is any moisture, it'll be able to just dissipate. Whereas if you put it in a plastic bag or a jar, it'll you know, build up moisture. So my preference is not to use plastic. Um, don't crush the leaves. Leave things whole as much as possible and break it up when you're going to use it because it's going to stay more vibrant if you can leave it whole. The commercially, the uh, companies will cut and sift the herb up into small pieces a lot of times. And that is what they need to do for large storage. But for me, I can leave the herbs whole and then I can just break them down if I need them and they're going to have more flavor and the aromatics will be retained better. Um, so um, just crush them when you're ready to use them, and then you can add them um, to your dishes so, or whatever you need. So herbally, we can make what are called infused oils. This is another way to put your herbs up um, other than drying them. So there are different methods for doing this, but you can actually take the herb, chop it up, put it in a jar, pour olive oil or some other oil on top. I prefer olive. Because a stable oil 
And you can do this for culinary purposes or for herbal medicine purposes. Um, rosemary is one of my favorite ones for culinary purposes. It's really wonderful if you're making a dish and um, you saute onions, for example, and rosemary into your soil. And I'm not talking putting a few sprigs in the oil. I'm talking like fills and jars so that it's green. What happens with rosemary, for example, the oil will be green and really vibrant and it'll be really strong for the first few days. So these oils are nice to have around. And then if you are interested herbally, like this is a calendula infused oil, which is wonderful for your skin. Um, I do wilt calendula for a few days before I put it in the oil so it doesn't curl out on the oil. Do you have to worry about molding or anything? Do you have to do anything to the herb before you put it Well, I in said the I wilt calendula well, first. But, but that keeps it from molding? Yeah, So because what happens is it um, evaporates some of the moisture out of the plant. And I do that with calendula, comfrey, chickweed, when I make infusions with those plants. Whereas like rosemary, lavender, they're very dry. They don't need to be molded. Just ones that have a lot of moisture. Yeah, because infused oils that are molded smell awful. <laughs> They're not fun. Then there's a heating method. I just want, I don't utilize this method myself, but you can heat the herb where you warm it. I just like to tell you that because you'll read different strategies. I've only done this if I'm out of something and I really need it right away because I find the um, cold infused oils to be, and the steeping of the fresher to be a lot more vibrant. This is usually dry plant material and you warm the herb for a period of time and boil the oil. And it compromises the integrity of the oil too, which isn't my favorite thing, because fluctuation in temperature from an advanced state is real slow. So it's nice to get the herb into the oil, but if your oil is bad, it <laughs> defeats your purpose. So. Mm -hmm. And then infused vinegars, I talked about those earlier. Um, you can infuse most of these herbs in vinegar and get a nice um, tasting vinegar. And then you can put it on your salads. And look how beautiful that salad looks with the flowers. Remember I was saying just sprinkle a few flowers on top of the salad and people will be super impressed. We've got violets and um, dandelions, it looks like, and roses. So um, it's really wonderful. And um, dandelion is one of my favorites to put in vinegar. It's really good for your liver. It helps digestion. Um, it's just, and you can, the whole dandelion is edible. I was so happy the book I was looking at before we started growing herbs in the Midwest um, has dandelion in it. <laughs> I was like, oh, how wonderful. So um, I know a lot of gardeners uh, have a battle with dandelion, but really learn to love this plant. It is one of the most nutritious plants on the planet. It supports our liver, which works really hard. And so, um, you know, just it helps digestion, which a lot of people have digestive problems. Probably one of the biggest things I talk to people about in my consultation practice are digestive problems. And just having a little bit of dandelion in your diet somewhere, whether it's a drink or a vinegar um, or however you want to ingest it, can just really, really improve digestion. No, I just scrub it a little bit if there's dirt or yeah. But I don't I don't peel it. No, I don't peel anything at all. <laughs> there's a lot of nutrition in that peel. So you can go ahead. Um, so I'm a home cheese maker. <laughs> I'm actually in the process of making a lot of cheese right now. Um, but one of the things is adding herbs to oils and cheeses and fats not only adds flavor, but it adds nutrients too. It actually um, adds the soil soluble nutrients um, or extracts them out of the herb and makes them bioavailable to the body. So vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K are all oil soluble. And if you put them in your, in your cheeses, in your whatever you're making, um, it'll make those nutrients more bioavailable to the body. And I think most of us have heard we need more vitamin D in our diet. So this is one way to get that. So. Okay. Pestos is another way. So make these herbs into really wonderful pestos. They all can be put made into a pesto. I said you can make a basil parsley. You can put a little rubbish in your pesto, whatever flavors you want. Um, and you can freeze pestos. They're really nice to have in the winter. And, you know, we have more trouble getting green 
green things in our diet in the winter. So having these pestas in the freezer are really nice because you can cool it out and add it to soups, add it to dressings, whatever you want um, to add them to. And then it's in oil. So again, it's going to make those oil-soluble nutrients more bioavailable to the body. One of the big reasons I do a lot of this stuff is to increase the nutrient density of my food. Rather than take like vitamin supplements, I'm getting it from my food by being a tricky monkey <laughs> and preparing them in a way that makes these things more bioavailable to my body. And these herbs are incredibly high in nutrition. It's really amazing. We'll see that. But if you just eat them a little bit on your um, food, just as a spice, you're not going to get the nutrition. This, these are the ways you need to prepare them to actually get the nutrition from them. Have you ever put dandelion in here still? Yes. <laughs> Dandelion leaves, leaves, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Usually I'll add other things too, but absolutely. Yeah. Um, honey, I love honey. Who doesn't love honey, right? <laughs> um, so don't eat too much honey, but you know, eating honey is a good thing. So I'm adding herbs to honey. Um, this is lavender honey, um, which is really delicious. And rosemary honey is delicious. Any kind of um, herb you can add to honey will add really, really nice flavor. Mm -hmm. Elderberries, you can make a simple syrup by adding um, your herbs to um, honey, like the Ella Campaign root I talked about earlier is a herb for um, the respiratory system. Just chop the root up, put it in some honey. I usually put a little vinegar in there too and make what we call an oxymal, so I mix vinegar and honey in the herb and just stir that. It's so that simple. You don't have to cook anything, just stir it in and let it sit for a period of time, four to six weeks, strain it out, and you've got yourself a nice soft syrup. Or do you want to show me what is, is the source of vitamin B, C, D, and E? How much mm -hmm. can we have to eat to get that? Yeah, well, vitamin C, not much, because okay. the fresh plant will exert a lot of vitamin C. you a lot of vitamin C and, and other good drugs. You, you don't need to eat honey for vitamin C. Right, you don't need to. No, but but you need fresh plant material for vitamin C. Yeah. So putting the fresh plants in the honey makes the vitamin C more bioavailable. Okay, so what about the honey and the D&E? Just eat the honey? Yeah, so you just take it by the spoonful yeah. okay, or mix it in with a little bit of warm water, not too hot for the vitamin C, mm -hmm. but a little bit of warm water. You know, one thing is you want diversity in your diet. So, you know, you'll have a little honey, a little pesto, a little cheese, um, a salad. You know, you need diversity. So I'm not saying, like, this is going to give you all of your vitamin C, for example. But it will give you a little bit. So, every, you know, everything that you're eating. One way, in m from my perspective, you can get more of this stuff is to make a really nice salad dressing. And you put some honey, some vinegar, some really nice olive oil. So, you know, you get all of the herbs into one place in a salad dressing. So that's what I'm saying, like, be your tricky monkey. You need diversity. You can't just eat, um, eat a spoonful of honey and get all of your nutrients. So. I'm sorry, I have to go, but I'm yeah. curious about the real world boxes. Is that oh, what you yeah, said? Yeah. Where do you get those? I know a woman who's selling them. If you want to email me, I can Okay, it's in the, the, yeah. the... Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. This yeah, has been thank wonderful. You. And what time are we supposed to go to? Mm -hmm. We want to explain. Okay, good. So we, I, I'm on target. Okay. <laughs> okay, we can go to Do you... Um, like grind up the lavender at all or do you not for the honey i just take the flowers off and put the flowers in the honey so but i don't grind it up mm -hmm. yeah because the aromatic the volatile oils give themselves away i'm just thinking do you eat it in your oh oh i strain it flavor. out after it soaks in the honey then i strain the lavender out because the lavender becomes really bitter when you break down the cell wall, there's some bitter compounds back there and it doesn't taste so good. But when I make rose petal infused honey, for example, I leave the roses in there because they taste delicious. So it depends on what herb I'm working with. Yeah, what about like if you put it in yogurt, like lavender the, yogurt? Lavender honey? The flavoring, flavoring, just lavender. I would put lavender honey in the yogurt. I wouldn't put lavender okay. in, the, in the yogurt because lavender tastes kind of bitter when it's on its own, but when you put it, like people will make lavender sugars, and you know, I like the honey because I don't eat refined sugar, but um, you know, the, the honey, the sweet makes it taste a little better. But you can bake it into things, powdered, 
that way, but putting it in yogurt, I don't know. I mean, you can try it, but it tastes better to me. I, don't I put know. a little stevia leaf in it. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just play, but play with it. See what you like. You might like something I don't. So I mean, it's all partly a matter of you know how, how does the flavor work for you. So um, rose hips are one of my favorite things to put in honey. <laughs> These are ragosa rose hips. They taste like maraschino cherries, basically. <laughs> They're really delicious. Um, and so I like to put those up. At, um, it's fresh. Um, rose hips are really high in vitamin C when they're fresh. And so that vitamin C is going to be bioavailable. So um, that's one of the th ways I like to prepare this. With honey, I'm always using, utilizing raw honey personally, which is also good for um, boosting your immune system and pre preventing and or um, addressing allergy, you know, allergy um, issues. So um, I really like to use the raw honey, but be aware that um, there are botulism spores, not botulism, but spores in honey. And so young children are under one year of age will not ingest honey, raw honey because of those spores, they can't um, eliminate them, and we can, and our digestive system breaks them down, so. What if you have stomach issues, will it break them down then? Adults don't seem to have a problem with it, whether they have problems or not. I've never seen anybody have a botulism problem, so, uh, that was an adult. And I've never seen a child either, because I know a lot of parents will give it to their kids anyway, but it's just something that I like to tell people. <laughs> Okay, so um, hopefully you've gotten a lot of ideas and <laughs> inspiration. Um, be creative. There's a ton more stuff and information. I've given you, if you go to the next page, I've given you a resource list. This isn't an, um, an exhaustive list. Um, there's certainly many more lists. And they have some really nice books over here. I teach a lot at libraries, and I'm always amazed, you know, they always bring out books and it's up for whatever topic, because I do fermentation classes and cheese making classes and herb classes, and they're always bringing out these books that I've never seen before, like the um, one for gardening in the Midwest, it's a nice little book, I'm going to get a copy of it or maybe I'll pick it out and read it. So, um, so there's just lots of resources at your library, don't be afraid to access them. Yes. Have you ever lived in the city? I lived in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you, you were able to follow this? And yes. Yeah. Yes. It's really easy to grow. And actually, honestly, I've always lived in small cities other than Seattle. So like I lived in Sheboygan, which is a city of 50,000 people. And I now live here in Stoughton. This is a small city in my mind. And so um, I've always urban gardened, pretty much. I haven't lived in a farming area. I did own land in Coon Valley. I owned 20 acres for a period of time. Um, but mostly I foraged there. I didn't garden there so much. So I've mostly urban farmed. And urban farming, I think, is really, uh, um, the, the techniques are different. You don't have as many pest problems, like, especially animal problems, at least I don't. I haven't. Um, there's, there's pros and cons, of course, to, to either or, because space, one of the things that I find is using, I'm trained as a permaculturist, and in permaculture, they talk a lot about stacking, and stacking means that you're um, stacking plants so that you can fit them in smaller spaces. And that's what I was talking about, you know, when we're um, putting smaller things in the front, bigger things in the back. Like we can do a lot of stacking. You do spiral garden is a way of stacking because you grow a lot of stuff in a small condensed place. So, um, so yeah, I love, you know, growing in these kinds of arenas. You can grow a lot of food and herbs on a small piece of property. You don't have to have a huge piece of property. And permaculture is, is a way of thinking about growing that is really common sense. I mean, it's something that you know people have put into a model and a formula that we can try to think about. But if you just look at your land and how things work, and like we were talking earlier about um, planting things um, in microclimates where you have retaining walls that retain heat, um, you can think about all of these things. Um, when I lived in Sheboygan, we had a greenhouse off of the back of our house, so we were doing all our own starts. 
and then we were growing. You know, we had a huge raspberry patch, we had a huge grape orchard, we had fruit trees. I mean, this is on a city lot, so um, you can grow so much in a small space. And herbs, especially, are really, really great for small spaces. How did you learn about herbs? How did I learn about herbs? So I have um, trained with two different herbalists early on that I apprenticed with. They were not your family. They were not my family, no. Um, so, but they became, become my family because both of, well, all, 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 most of my teachers are still in my life 10 years ago. So there's something, of, and you know, it's like gardening clubs. I think there's something, they have something in common that you love and you care about is health and the herbs and, and the planet. And, you know, and you, you develop a connection, even if it's not your blood family, the biological family. Have, I have my like herbal family, <laughs> so and we, you know, have as many skirmishes as uh, biological <laughs> family. <laughs> but some people do learn from our, yeah. from their family. I learned a lot from my father. From your father, sure. Um, and which is actually unusual. Younger, I do a lot of teaching of traditional skills, cheese making, fermentation, basket weaving. These are all skills we would have learned from our grandmothers and grandfathers and foremothers. And the younger gener younger generations are not learning that, including me, from our parents or grandparents. So I like teaching for that reason because I have these skills and knowledge and I want to pass it on. When you know this stuff, you want to share it. I mean, there's something really joyful about sharing and passing it on. So yes, um, you know, we might not get it as much from our um, elders in our biological family, but hopefully there are people who are willing to share. And I mean, clubs like yours, it's great to have a garden club where you can share information and resources. And it's wonderful that you learn from your father. That's really special. And it's super unusual these days. I mean, because people aren't doing as much growing and gardening and um, you know, farming. But then he, now this the family was in Chicago, and he went out and spent, I don't know, several seasons, I believe, in Nebraska mm. to another branch of the family. And he learned a lot of what we knew about farming in Nebraska, right? With How many of people have learned about herbs or gardening from a family member? How many have learned from the other people in your garden club? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> because even if you learn from your family. Um, now, I, you know, I went and trained with the herbalists that I studied with. Two of them I actually went and lived with them for months at a time. So it was a very traditional apprenticeship type of learning environment, which I'm really grateful for. It wasn't an academic exercise. It was actually experiential. It was actually hands-on living, eating, breathing. I mean, to me, this is a lifestyle, it's a life way. It's not just something I do. It's something, it's a way that I'm living my life and I'm bringing these things in. And then, you know, what I start sharing as I go along. Yeah. How old were you and how did you become so passionate about it before you lived with the herbalist? How old was I when I went and did that? Um, I was in my 20s. And um, I met a woman, I was a social worker, and I met a woman who was passionate about herbs for her own health that I was working with. And she started teaching me, kind of informally, taking me out and introducing me to plants. And, um, and I just, my passion just grew. And then I went and studied with her teachers and lived with them. Um, yeah, and it just grew into this incredible passion of, it's, you know, it's about the plants, it's about, for me, it's about the earth. It's about relationships. It's about being able to spend time with other people who care about this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, the animals and the critters, and, you know, it's just a whole, it's, it's a whole lifestyle and a life way. So the passion grew. Um, although I feel like St. John Hort was the first plant I ever wild harvested, and I feel like the plant kind of took me and said, okay, it's you. <laughs> you get to do this. I feel, I feel lucky every single day. So this is really your second career. Probably my third. 
<laughs> I was saying that yesterday. And we were talking about how, you know, if you've done something your whole entire life, you don't know what else to do. I'm like, well, I'm on my third incarnation, so I'll find, if, if I'm not doing this, I'll find something else to do. But this kind of combines a lot of my passions. I mean, I've been passionate about healthcare. I've worked in the healthcare field. You know, I was a social worker. I'm passionate about people and connecting to people. And then, you know, the science. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll stick around for a little bit. Thank you. Any questions?